wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, welcome to the show, the big podcast. So it's good to have you guys again. After 12 years, we're always happy to see you once again. Be sure, as always, to, if you don't subscribe already to all the different features of the social media on our thing, make sure you subscribe to those things. YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, or tell your friends and neighbors. To subscribe, just knock on your neighbor's door when you borrow sugar from them. Does anybody still do that anymore? My mom used to always make me knock on the neighbor's door and go hustling for sugar and and baking soda and what whatever we were cooking that she was out of. Uh, but I think nowadays you can't do that. Otherwise, uh, people people I don't know they call the cops on you or, or fire weapons at you. I think I don't know, man. It's been a long time. Maybe that's a good way. I mean, I I don't know what the kids are doing these days, but. You can go to also goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss, all of our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, the big 122,000 LinkedIn group, and our LinkedIn newsletter. Subscribe to that as well. That's always fun. It's just entertainment as always. Oh, and also you can go to, we're giving away um, a couple of these extra EKSTR wallets, and uh, they've got some finders in them too. You can go to Chris Voss, the Chris Voss Show forward slash giveaway, I believe, and you can find out more about the show, what we're giving and enter the giveaway there. Anyway, guys, we have another amazing person on the show. Today, we have Stephanie Dorwart on the show. She's the owner of Altius Healthcare Consulting Group, and she focuses her consulting practice on workforce optimization, productivity, leadership development, and performance implementation. As an architect of successful labor management system. She has worked with hospitals ranging in size from 25 to 900 size beds. Wow, that's a lot of beds. Most recently, she constructed and built content for Virtual Training Academy designed to train healthcare leaders to become the CEO and CFO of their department and cost center. Stephanie serves on the board of Western PA chapter of American College of Healthcare Executives, and she recently founded a nonprofit called the v Valacron Foundation? Valacron. There you go. Foundation that will provide scholarships to students in the local community. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. How are you? I'm doing great, Chris. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to join the podcast with you and look forward to sharing some more information with your audience. Thank you. We're excited to have you as well. Give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Dot com is Altius, A L T I U S H C G dot com. And you can find us across all the other social platforms as well on the same moniker. There you go. So give us an overview of what Altius Healthcare Consulting Group does. Absolutely. So Altius Healthcare Consulting Group really focuses on improving the financial performance, operational performance of hospitals and healthcare organizations, Chris. We primarily want to make sure that our clients have the right person in the right place at the right time with the right tools for the right clinical outcome. In healthcare today, as you can imagine, that's a really large challenge, but we really want to focus on making sure that our clients are as efficient as possible, but have the strongest patient outcomes as well. So we do everything from helping them schedule their patients a little bit better to ensuring that they have the right level of staff based on the volume of the staff to educating and elevating their leaders so that they actually understand how to manage their individual departments. And it was, it's probably been a wild ride these past few years with trying to, you know, place People, you know, I know a lot of nurses and stuff have, and doctors have been moving around the country with the COVID and stuff. It has absolutely been a wild ride the last two and a half years. And I, I think that ride continues for mm -hmm. healthcare leaders and healthcare executives and the workforce in general. You know, I think in the beginning, everyone was scattering, trying to figure out how to actually respond to the pandemic. So there were a lot of stopgap, you know, places put in place to actually care for the patients. There were some workforce shortages at that place, some supply disruptions, but everyone was really focusing on how can we actually provide care to all the patients that we have 
We're now, as we're coming through two and a half years into this, it's a little bit different situation. We're now dealing with workforce shortages where, you know, depending on what statistics you look at, anywhere from one out of every three to one out of every four workforce of this healthcare workforce have left the bedside, meaning that we have staggering shortages across the field. And in other areas, we have you know, shortages with physicians. There are some issues with travelers where the actual costs have gone up. Supply chain still continue to be an issue. And then if you add on top to that, what everyone else is experiencing right now with the escalation with cost is yeah. all inflationary measures. Hospitals, healthcare organizations are struggling. Yeah, it's everyone's struggling. Like everywhere I go here, you know, I see help wanted signs. And I don't know, I, I suppose maybe the cooling of the economy is going to affect some of this. So how long have you been doing this for with your consulting group? Yeah, so I've been on the healthcare side of the business now for nearly 20 years. Wow. I started out actually as a mathematics teacher. No. Oh. Um, you know, in <laughs> whenever I was going into school, I was actually aeronautics engineering and my sophomore year realized <laughs> that it probably wasn't for me whenever we were doing simulations and my plane crashed. So I figured I'd better stay on the statistics side of things. Mm -hmm. I at one point realized I, you know, wanted to go back and mirror my initial passion, which I always wanted to be a pediatrician growing up. I was the youngster oh. that walked around with a stethoscope, oh. took all of my relatives' heartbeat, et cetera, and pulse. So I went back to get my master's of healthcare administration. And it was within the first week of working at that organization that I realized I had a passion for productivity and workforce optimization. That hospital had had a reduction in force the week prior to my arrival, where they had to lay off about 200 of their staff members. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they didn't actually have the systems in place to ensure the culture was maintained following that, mm -hmm. or the systems in place to make sure they never got back to that situation. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what happens in healthcare is you make quick and rapid changes, like a reduction in force where you lay off 200 people to only realize you actually needed half of them a couple months later. So I really made it my priority to research everything that I could, put in place the databases and build out the structures mm -hmm. to ensure that healthcare organizations had a better way to manage their staffing resources. Mm -hmm. And why are you so passionate about your mission to help community hospitals? What, what, what motivates you to stay in this field? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I grew up in a small town called New Kensington, Pennsylvania. It's actually the town where the company Alcoa was founded. So we're responsible for aluminum of, in the beginning of aluminum, but we had a small hospital in that community called Citizens General Hospital. It's actually the hospital where I was born. Mm. And over a series of years and you know decisions that that organization made and dynamic impacts of organizations moving out of our town, that hospital actually closed. And whenever the hospital shuttered its doors, you know many of my friends' parents lost their jobs. A lot of the community restaurants had to close down. Many of the downtown businesses shut their doors because there wasn't that infrastructure of the actual hospital, which was one of the largest providers of employees in you know, our town, or our largest employers in our town at the time. So it became really a passion of mine that I really strongly believe that all communities across the country have a right to high quality care and have a right to have a hospital in their community to provide services to them whenever they need that. That's extremely important right now in rural communities as well as other areas. So I'm really passionate about the fast fact that everyone, regardless of where you live, should have access to care. And one of those pieces is to have a hospital that you're actually able to go to in cases of emergencies. Yeah, I've I've read over the years one of the biggest problems rural communities have is is they they they're losing these community hospitals, and COVID, of course, was completely overwhelming for them. And, and I guess a lot of people, you know, we really fried out our nurses and doctors with COVID. I mean, I saw, you know, the, lots of different posts on burnout and different things. And, and you know, it, it kind of reached this point where, you know, so many doctors and nurses were just so sick of the COVID kind of attitudes that were overwhelming. They're just like, take the medicine and just the craziness of it all. So what, you know, you telemedicine has been a big thing. How has that maybe impacted what you're doing and, and, and how you see it coming forward in the future? Telemedicine is a great topic and it plays into rural health a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, initially telemedicine was used very infrequently within the, you know, industry and very few patients were actually accessing it. But what's happened with the pandemic is many organizations that did not even have a telemedicine infrastructure 
had to stand it up overnight. We had mm-hmm. clients that had never done one telemedicine or telehealth visit prior to the pandemic, but within a week, about 60 to 70% of their visits were actually done through telehealth. Wow. What's happening right now, Chris, as we get to this stage, you know, telehealth is becoming a big way to actually provide access to specialties in rural communities. For example, maybe you live in a rural community and you actually have to, you know, access a cardiologist, but there's not a cardiologist that's readily available in your local community. Well, through partnerships with large academic medical centers or other tertiary providers, you now can actually have a telehealth visit. And while you're wearing things like, you know, your eye watch and other components of home health, you can actually monitor your health in a better way and actually have those telehealth visits with the cardiologist without having to get into the car and drive 80 minutes, 90 minutes, you know, 60 miles away to actually get to that appointment. So you have more frequent contact with the specialist and you can actually spread it out. Another way that telehealth is making an extremely large impact right now is in the behavioral health community. I'm not sure, you know, if you've heard it all about how overwhelmed you mentioned burnout of the actual clinicians, and that's a big factor, but there's also a larger influx of behavioral health issues coming into emergency departments across the country. And in many cases, the hospital staffs don't have the resources to actually respond to those behavioral health needs. So Mm -hmm. one way to actually help to kind of stopgap that is to have access to telehealth behavioral health visits. So people that do have anxiety, depression, other components in many cases that have been brought on by the pandemic issues can actually have access to those resources and actually deal with it prior to it actually reaching a breaking point. And telehealth is a great way to provide that. You can actually have your telehealth visit in the middle of your workday if you need to over your lunch break or at the end of the day. So it makes it much more accessible to patients across the country. Yeah, I mean, telehealth has saved me uh, quite a few times in recent in recent memory. Some there was one or two times where I was so sick with pretty much walking pneumonia that I couldn't get out of bed, but I needed a Z. And I, I mean, I couldn't drive down to the doctors. I couldn't even get to the drive to the clinic. I had somebody drive me to the clinic, but just I'd sit up in bed and the world would spin. And the telehealth saved me. In 2012, I wrote an, an article with uh, Forbes magazine calling out the need for telehealth. And at the time, there wasn't any. I should have I should have invested in and started one. But we had a telehealth doctor on yesterday. It's just it's great that this is coming through and helping rural communities. I never even thought about rural communities, you know, helping them and and everything that they're doing. The you know, you guys also do virtual training academy evolved with you guys, and you guys have set one up, I guess, through your guys' portal. How does that work? Yeah, so the virtual training academy, you know, came on as a result of the pandemic, but it was really in the works prior to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. We were building up what would be, you know, an in-person curriculum where, you know, you do your typical group training that emerged because what we found with our clients when we were going in to do performance improvement is a lot of times in healthcare, we're great at recognizing the strong clinicians and the strong doctors and the strong leaders and promoting them up from the bedside to the management role, but we're not as good at actually providing them with the training and the tools to help them understand what is a budget? How do you build a budget? How do you manage your budget? You know, what is an FTE? How do you resource that? How do you hire the right individuals and then help them to improve their performance? And so the managers would come into the roles and we'd be working through the performance improvement projects with them in the action planning, but they didn't know some of the basics. So we were building up curriculum to be able to support our clients and realize whenever the pandemic hit that we really needed to provide all this in a virtual platform. So that as managers come into their roles, they have access to all the information they need when they need it. So whether they're dealing with change management or they have to figure out what are the right interview questions to ask an individual, How do you locate the right staff? How do you retain the right workforce? We built that all into a virtual training academy. So we can not only help our hospitals identify what they need to do to improve operations, but each of their individual managers can improve their skills. So it was really a labor of love where we recorded out about 120 different segments and each of the managers can go through and earn three different certificates on process improvement, on change management, and just on operations overall. That's pretty awesome. And it's probably needed considering people that have left the system and, and, uh, you know, they probably need more people to move up through the ranks of management for the holes that have been created from people leaving. The great resignation was kind of weird, man. <laughs> it's all, it how is. it all, how, how it all has come out. I mean, some people left forever. Some people regret switching 
stuff. I don't know. It's it's going to be interesting. Any other big changes that you expect are going to occur? You know, I think that there are a lot of disruption that's going to happen in healthcare and a lot of in innovation that's occurring. Mm. Uh, we're seeing a lot of changes happening with, you know, AI and artificial you know, components of things happening. I think that's going to continue to evolve. One of the areas that's advancing a lot, of course, is whenever you, you know, start to think about oncology and research dealing with all of that. And we've already always had large electronic health records that are pulling all of this information in. But historically, there's not really systems that talk to one another. Mm -hmm. I think that we will see, and things in healthcare move slowly, so it's probably not going to happen, happen as quickly as we would like. I think we will see more interoperability of all that information mm -hmm. so that we can leverage that in a way that protects everyone's privacy, but also allows us to understand what types of treatments are best for what types of patients. And we even saw that with you know, the pandemic and COVID-19 where certain types of blood types were responding differently to the infections yeah. and different patients with comorbidities had different outcomes and different treatments provided different results. But we couldn't do anything with that because it's in 20 different EHRs and mm. systems that you can't pull together. And so individual hospitals, individual communities had to rely on their own research and their yeah. own outcomes. I do see that down the road from a public health perspective, we will see all that coming together so that we can access information in a way that can support outcomes and research oriented, you know, therapies. That should I also, be pretty interesting. I also think, you know, we all know about Mark Cuban and what he's doing in the pharmaceuticals and, you know, what's happening with some of the other innovation and disruptors. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see more and more of that happening. You know, we, consistently see more for-profits moving in with CVS, Rite Aid, other components there. That's going to continue to disrupt. You're going to see more companies like what Mark Cuban did with the pharmaceuticals coming in and mm -hmm. really trying to cost contain within healthcare. Uh, right now, I mm -hmm. think healthcare is a $4.3 trillion industry. Is that so all? When you're dealing with a capitalistic, you know, environment and you see $4.3 trillion, more and more people are going to move in mm -hmm. to those, you know, then try to find ways to actually be profitable in those environments. And out of that $4.3 trillion, it's estimated that roughly $1 trillion of it is waste. Wow. Which means <laughs> from, you know, you think about that, 25% of every dollar that's mm -hmm. being spent on healthcare within the country is estimated to be waste. That waste can come from a variety of areas, administrative complexities, you know, cost complexities and price components of that, but also, you know, care issues, care that maybe was not necessary, but provided. And all of that breaks down into roughly $1 trillion of opportunity that I think people are going to try to leverage over time. Yeah, I mean that's that's a lot of waste. That's a lot of waste. I guess your estimates at twenty five percent. Yeah, it's pretty. That's pretty huge. It is. Yeah, and it it was large before the pandemic, and it's just grown since that time. Yeah. Now you've focused in your career on productivity. How do you define productivity, and and how is it important, especially in say the field you're in with the hospitals and stuff? Productivity is an interesting question. You know, most of the time when we're brought into hospitals and our clients and, you know, they find out that we're the productivity firm or the workforce uh -oh. optimization firm, there are groans and I think people are <laughs> <laughs> poor conception. We're always, I'd say, not the people that are, you know, the welcome mats rolled out for sometimes the executives love to have us there with, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, productivity by definition is really how much input or how much time does it take for an output? Mm -hmm. And it's easy for us to define that when we're thinking in terms of, you know, manufacturing, you know, how much time is it taking us to produce a car, but it's more difficult when it comes to healthcare. But mm -hmm. the way I really view productivity and the way I think about it is we all want to make the best use of the time that we have. And so mm -hmm. when you're thinking about being productive, you're thinking about how can I be the most effective that I can be? in the time that I have, whether it's in my personal life and work and just getting through the tasks that I have to work through. So productivity is improving efficiency, but more importantly, productivity to each individual person or hospitals 
how can we consistently improve performance so that we can get the most out of the time that we have for whatever we're doing? And so that's really what being productive is. It's really looking at what you're doing and making sure that you can eliminate any of the unnecessary time to produce that result. And that's true for whether it's you know scheduling a call, whether it's a radiology appointment, whether it's operating room, whatever you're doing is how can we actually get the best result possible in the shortest amount of time and the best quality results? There you go. I mean, that's that's how you eliminate waste is productivity right. and and exactly. uh, yeah, and and sometimes it's just you know, I imagine sometimes it's just streamlining different things, right? Making it uh, streamlining stuff so that it, it, you know, there's less hoops that people have to jump through and everything maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Streamlining processes, eliminating steps. Sometimes it's as simple as making sure that the supplies that someone needs are in the location that they need them, you know, making sure that the bandages are right beside the nurses in the emergency department instead of the storage closet, you know, down the hallway. Mm -hmm. And it's just little things like that that can actually make a big difference in the outcome that you're looking for. Sometimes it's eliminating reports that someone's still doing that no Mm -hmm. one's looking at. (laughs) There's a lot of waste in a lot of different places. And just taking, you know, a closer lens at that and looking at the steps to the process and looking at what individuals are doing can eliminate a lot of that. Yeah, those TPS reports. What was that movie Office Space? <laughs> the TPS <laughs> reports. We've done your TPS yeah. reports. Yeah, sometimes there can be real issues with, with you know, you, you spend so much time. I, you know, I've I've worked at well, we worked for a medical facility one time with one of our companies, and my partner worked inside them. And they spent so much time writing memos to cover their butts over crappy stuff that was happening around the office. They were they were constantly writing memos or emailing to try and cover their but to make sure that they couldn't get fired for something. I think at one point they, they had, they had put a a swipe key on the bathroom door so they could know how long people were sitting in the bathroom. It's kind of interesting. (laughs) Yeah. Very interesting. You know, I think, you know, one of the scary things too, just thinking about TPS and office, we're all, we're sometimes compared to the bobs, but you know, one of the scariest things that I see is we'll have executive teams or managers and directors, and we'll just ask for a 15 minute slot on their calendar. Mm -hmm. And they'll say that we can't schedule that for the next eight or nine weeks. The next time that, you know, Mr. X is available or Mrs. X is available is, you know, nine weeks from now at one o'clock or, you know, and there's a 15 minute opportunity where you can actually speak with them. And to think about that, to know that your entire calendar is filled from 7 a.m. in the morning until 7 p.m. at night for the next eight to nine weeks, there is no way you can manage a hospital. So I think that's also efficiency is you you don't really need a three hour meeting if you can accomplish that meeting in 45 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 you know, and meetings sometimes can, can be nightmarish where people just go on and on and, you know, the, the zoom, I've had so many friends that work for big corporations and the zoom call that they have to endure every day. They're like, oh, my 20th Zoom call today. Shoot me now. You know, you'll see him talking on Facebook and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> so it's really interesting. And uh, let's see, anything else we have talked about that we should talk about what you guys do for hospitals and stuff? Yeah, I, I think we've covered a lot of it. I think the most important thing right now is to just realize that we are going through, you know, some uh, what we consider be unprecedented times. That's absolutely true. You touched upon burnout. You know, I mm-hmm. think Retaining staff is extremely important currently, making sure that that staff is supported. But you can't really plan for the future if you don't have a plan. I I think right now, sometimes we're only looking a month ahead or three months ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's important to make sure that you have a plan in place with your workforce strategy, 12 months ahead, two years ahead, three years ahead, to manage what you're expecting to happen. So if you don't have a workforce strategic plan, or you don't understand how you're going to actually close your staffing shortages or your gaps or reduce your burnout or re- retain, it's really time to focus on what are your solutions going to be in those areas. And I think that's one of the things that we do great is looking at that organizational assessment, identifying the truth of where an organization currently is, and then putting a plan in place to actually leverage that, help to improve that performance moving forward. You can't really start an improvement process if you don't know where you are today. And you don't understand where you have to go in the future. 
That's very true. You no, know, uh, on leadership, you know, one of the things you guys do train and help on, what, what, what traits do leaders need to have in your mind in order to uh, lead organizations during these turbulent times? I, great question. You know, I think one of the traits that's really important right now for leaders to really be very strong at, and it can't be overstated enough, is transparency and communication. Mm -hmm. And I think that's extremely important because a lot of times whenever things get tough, we all have a tendency to retreat. And in today's environment, I think it's extremely important to be visible as a leader and to communicate the situation. You know, a lot of times, you know, you're going to be making changes within the organization, but you're not communicating why those changes are necessary. So whether you have to ask staff to cross train across departments or ask someone to move into a different position or a different role or just do things differently, hmm. you have to communicate why that's important. Yeah. If you can communicate why it's important, you can actually leverage that and then help to get everyone else on the track with why you have to change and then show them the plan for how. Sometimes we tell people what we're going to do and where we're going, but we don't give confidence that we actually know how we're going to get to the other side. So yeah. I think communicating and actually being transparent and then being mm -hmm. visible is extremely important. But, you know, I tell people right now that don't, do not be afraid of change. We have mm -hmm. to really embrace the change and push through where we might be comfortable. We have to become comfortable with the uncomfortable. And what that really means is if you're going down a path and you see it's not working, pivot quickly and try something new. So you don't be afraid of those changes understand what the direction is, but if it's not working exactly how you envision, pivot quickly and move in a different direction. So we really have to embrace that and as, as leaders really be visible to our staff, show compassion because people are dealing with a lot, show them that you care about them. You know, I'm sure you, you know, have heard the statistic, Chris, that people don't necessarily leave their positions and you mentioned the great resignation. Mm -hmm. Well, if great resignation continues to hold true and people are leaving positions because of leadership, mm. your number one thing as a leader is to improve your leadership skills and make sure your organization improves the leadership structure. Because if the great resignation continues in any way, shape or form, you want to make sure you're becoming the employer of choice and mm. doing that by having the best leaders that you possibly can. And that all starts with training. That's why one of the reasons that Altius is so passionate about educating and elevating leaders across the board, because you can't become a great organization if you don't have great leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and and people leave. They they go find better leaders. They 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 search out. They seek out leaders that uh, inspire them, motivate them. And if they don't have it, they just they just feel dead inside. They just feel like yeah, this place doesn't really seem to go where I want it to go. And it's super important. I wrote about it in my book, Beacons of Leadership, and it makes all the difference in the world. Well, it's been wonderful to have you on the show and go through all this very enlightening stuff. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so much, Chris, for having me. It's been great and a pleasure to join you today on the podcast. Thank you. Give us your dot coms, if you would, as we go out to help us out with the show. Absolutely. So the dot com is www.altiushcg.com. We're also at Altius HCG for Altius Healthcare Consulting Group on LinkedIn, on Facebook, and on Instagram. You there can you also go. follow me on Twitter at Stephanie Dorwart and on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. There you go. And we'll have the links on the Chris Voss Show, so check her out there. Thanks for coming on the show, guys, everyone. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks. To go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Go to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. Or go on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Instagram, all those crazy places, especially Instagram, or I'm sorry, not Instagram, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the place to be. That newsletter and the group, the big group that we have over there, subscribe to all that stuff. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Chris.